Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's professional development session on a high flex kit for any classroom. That would be high flex kit, sorry, <laughs> for any classroom. I'm Dave Giberson. I'm an old instructional design coordinator from Online Learning Pathways at the district. Um, I apologize today for breaking one of the fundamental rules of lighting in a Zoom meeting, which is having yourself sitting in front of a window. <laughs> I've cut down the light as much as I can, but this is the only room in the house that I have that has a table big enough to hold all this stuff that's not in my studio. And the point I'm trying to make here is that you don't have to be in your home studio to do this sort of thing. So uh, this is my dining room table and uh, we'll just have to put up with me being uh, a little vague here. You don't need to see me for this anyway. Well, um, so what are we talking about here today? What is high flex anyway? Well, it's every it's everything in the kitchen sink in terms of instructional modality. It combines just about every instructional modality <coughs> involving technology that we have uh, in a high flex classroom, as you can see from the little diagram there. You will have people sitting in the classroom with you. So you're teaching in class as you normally would. But you will also have people attending remotely via Zoom or uh, some other video conferencing service like uh, Microsoft Teams or whatever. This could work with any of those. And more often than not, in a, in a high flex class, you also have um, posted material that your students can access asynchronously on their own time. Material like assessments, uh, communication tools, instructional materials, lecture notes, PowerPoint presentations, videos, uh, pictures, things like that on Canvas our learning management system. So we're throwing everything we have into the mix here in high flex. Why? Well, the name says it all. It's a contraction of high flexibility instruction. This gives the students more flexibility, more options for accessing instruction, more capability to avail themselves of our instructional offerings here at the district than any other modality. Uh, students can choose to attend in the classroom, attend through Zoom, and maybe not do the same thing every day. They just may not feel like getting out of bed one day or getting too far out of bed one day, and they can attend class from their smartphone laying in bed effectively. So this has all sorts of advantages to us. Uh, it serves that population of students who really can't uh, access instruction in the classroom for any one of a variety of reasons. They're immunocompromised and they don't dare go out among, uh, among the population where they may be assaulted by any variety, number of uh, different infectious agents and things like that. They may have small children at home where they can't live alone. They don't have uh, child care. They may be homebound for any number of reasons. This gives them the option to uh, access the same high quality instruction that the students in the classroom do, if it's done right. And it provides extreme access to our instructional offerings. 
And folks, there's something like 28 words in the mission statement for the San Diego Community College District upon which we are evaluated every few years by accrediting agencies. And one of those words is access. We provide access to all of our student populations, instructional access, or access to our instruction, to all of our populations. HyFlex is one way to assure that. So it is a wonderful idea. <laughs> Obviously, it's, there's some, uh, some things we have to do to make this work. But this provides safety, flexibility, access, and increased participation. Here's another factor. Courses sometimes will make, if they're offered in high flex mode, that wouldn't, make, that wouldn't be allowed to continue otherwise because of insufficient enrollment particularly in these days. I know we hear on TV that the pandemic is over. I heard that on 60 Minutes the other night. But last time I checked, there's still 400 people dying every day from COVID. Forget all the other possible uh, reasons that people might not have, might have to not participate in person. If we really want our courses to make, this is a, a way to increase enrollment for sure. And indeed, our enrollment is down. Everyone's enrollment is down. This is a way that we can use to help bring it back up. Um, but the pedagogy is a little different than what we're used to. Well, it contains a mixture of everything that we've ever learned to do in any instructional modality that we've operated in uh, historically. But that shouldn't mean that you can't do what you need to do to get to teach in your subject. Ideally, high flex is pedagogy neutral. You, teach, you ought to be able to teach your class the way you you know that works for you and your subjects and your students and your subject and the technology should just facilitate that without getting in the way <laughs> uh, that's an ideal obviously there are some limitations that are going to be placed in a situation like this by the technology available but that's what today's um, seminar is mainly going to focus on is how to remove those um, those limitations. What we are talking about here is that we've been talking for years about classrooms without walls. I mean, that, that's one of those uh, <laughs> uh, buzz, buzz phrases that is utilized an awful lot and is an ideal <laughs> that, we, that we ascribe to or that we aspire to here. But the basic idea is that everyone, you, the teacher, local students, whom we usually refer to as roomies, <laughs> and remote students, usually referred to as Zoomies, given that we're normally using Zoom as a video conferencing adjunct in, in high flex classes, but uh, they could be Teamies as well if they were <laughs> if you were using Microsoft Teams. Zoom is not an essential part of this, but everyone should be able to see and hear one another, and see any visual aids that you're using to uh, teach with PowerPoint presentations. Uh, anything comes up on your computer screen, videos, and so on. Anything that you normally use in your teaching. You should be able to share both video and audio with your students in the room and your students uh, at home or in their offices or sitting on a, sitting off the coast of Japan in an early Burke destroyer cutting through or, or transiting, God help, transiting the Taiwan Straits or something. Um, we have students all over and they should all be able to hear and see everything in a high flex class. 
So how are we going to do that? <laughs> well, there is some technology that's necessary for this sort of thing. Some technology over and above what you'd normally find in a, uh, in a standard classroom. Uh, we can pretty much uh, depend these days on a classroom containing a video projector to which we can hook our laptop, a laptop, or which is connect, and or which is connected to a podium computer, and some kind of sound system, a speaker system, so that uh, com sound that comes out of the computer can be shared with the people in the room. They can hear whatever. If you play a video on the computer, they can hear the sound. Or if people in an in a remote setting speak, they can be heard through that sound system. Um, we'll see there, if the classroom doesn't contain even that much technology, there are ways around that too. But um, it's a lot easier, <laughs> generally, and certainly simpler, uh, if that minimum level of technology is present in your classroom. And in most cases these days it will be. But there are things that you need that aren't there. High flex instruction, however, doesn't necessarily require massive amounts of technology expenditure to bring a classroom up to the minimums necessary to carry out high flex instruction. I mean, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars or more on classroom technology uh, in classrooms that are intended to be used for high flex uh, instruction. And that's wonderful. It makes life easier and everybody can hear and see better and you have options that you might not have otherwise, though not that many, but it's just not essential. What we're going to talk about in today's session is a, um, a basic high flex kit, as the uh, title of the session implied that will provide the basics needed to perform high flex instruction in just about any classroom. And it doesn't have to cost tens of thousands of dollars. The essential tech that we're going to be looking at here today can be had, the setup I've got here, absent the projector, which I'll show you in a moment, um, is about $1,600 worth of equipment. But that includes the laptop, which is the bulk of it, the bulk of the cost. The rest of the cost is between five and six hundred dollars. So it's something that can be done. Um, it's not completely out of the reach of an individual instructor, but certainly is well within the uh, budget of most uh, of most departments to create a kit or two like this. And everything that we're going to be talking about today can be transported. It's all portable in a single backpack. Uh, it does <laughs> have a little, <laughs> my particular setup has a little heft. It's, uh, it's about 20 pounds, but that's not out of the range of possibility. You can uh, put it on a little hand truck if you have a a uh, traveling case that you use to carry your materials from classroom to classroom and so on. You can strap this on the top of it and, and, uh, and, and roll it around. Or you, it, backpack, you can just put it over your shoulders and, and walk away with it. The, um, so what we're talking about here is not free, but it's not twenty thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment either and that obviously not every classroom can be outfitted that extensively uh, and that technically but this kit will make it work this is uh, what i've got what i'm going to be showing you here today is an an extension of my uh, go kit, my traveling kit. 
I love doing these professional development seminars, but I'm retired. I don't want to be stuck at home. Uh, I do seven or eight of these in a month for online learning pathways. And I don't want to be rooted to the house all of that time, every week. So I created this kit, which I can take with me, throw in the back of the car, throw into the overhead bin on an airliner, and I can do this from anywhere. Not just from my dining room here. So um, with just a few additions to that, I can also take this into a classroom, or my dining room in this case, and do high flex instruction. And we'll see what's involved here as we go along. And there's the backpack over there uh, in, the, uh, in the background there, just a standard day pack kind of backpacks and not even a something you'd take if you were going to walk the Pacific Crest Trail or something. All right, let's take a look at the components in this kit. What I've got here is a little speeded up video that we'll, I'll show you and talk about. And let me get back to where you can see that occurs to me I'm not on the right there <laughs> all right we're going to start off with a, a laptop that's going to be the core of this obviously you've got to have a good laptop computer uh, in my cost estimates I allowed a thousand dollars for that you can get quite a good laptop these days if it's a PC laptop a Windows PC laptop you can get quite a good laptop for that a MacBook is going to cost you more but not impossibly more. It just depends on your choice of platform and your preference, platform preference. This laptop is a, uh, a gaming laptop. It's uh, from a company called MSI. And that's a good way to approach um, <coughs> the buying of computers. If you want something with a little bit more power and a little bit more capability, there's nothing that puts more demands on a computer than a computer gaming. So if you buy a machine, even if you're never planning on gaming, I, I am not a gamer. I, I've never been, a, never been one of my vices. But if you buy a computer that's equipped for that, you're going to get faster speeds, more memory, better video, and more ports, more, connect, more ways to connect stuff to it. Uh, this is an, uh, an MSI, the low-end MSI Raider laptop cost me about $1,400 at Costco some time ago, so it's probably less than that now. All right. And something I absolutely cannot get along without. If I'm teaching high flex or uh, even if it's not, even if I'm just teaching via Zoom, I can't get along with a single monitor anymore. It could be done, and people do it every day, but I really hate being limited to one monitor. The, um, let's see. What you see here is a little else, um, uh, LED monitor. Uh, that one ran about 300 and some dollars. If you can get away, if you're younger, younger than I am and your eyesight's better, you can get away with a fifth. This is a 17 inch monitor. If you can get by with a smaller one, you can cut about a hundred dollars off that. It is completely portable. It gives excellent video quality. Uh, got it off Amazon. It's uh, made by some company in the Far East. It doesn't even require separate power. 
I can, it takes power off the laptop and can be hooked up using a single cable to the laptop if the laptop has an appropriate set of ports. Um, the, uh, and it gives me a second monitor. I'm, I'm using it right now. There it is, that one right there. So I've got my PowerPoint slides up on that monitor and my Zoom window up on this monitor uh, in front of the laptop monitor itself so I can run the session effic uh, efficiently. The And I can park windows over on this monitor and bring them in at an appropriate time. It just gives me all sorts of capability. Um, oh, good question. All sorts of capability I would lack otherwise. Lisa, great, um, great question. Can this be done wirelessly? Yes. You, there, there are displays that you can set up that would could be connected wirelessly. Windows 10 and above has that capability and so does um, the MacBook through uh, AirPlay. So yes, they could be done uh, wirelessly. And this monitor also has capability to daisy chain. That is, I can put yet another monitor on the end of this by running another cable, running another cable from this monitor to a next one and so on. But in this case, it's only a single USB-C cable, just a little, one little bitty cable, very small connectors, easy to plug in and out. So wireless wouldn't really be that big of an advantage, but it should work. Where it's possible, I like wires because they're, they're reliable. Wireless <coughs> is something that if you're in a situation where you really want things to work, wireless can be a problem because it is flaky. Sometimes it will let you down. A wire is much less likely to do so. So yeah, where possible, I use wires, but that's more of personal experience. <laughs> I've had things flake out on me in the middle of a session too often. I am using a wireless internet connection right now though, because that's really uh, would be not impossible. I would just have to have an ethernet cable about 20 feet long here to plug my laptop directly into my network though there'd still be a wireless component to it here at, here at home. But, and indeed in a classroom, you might well have the option to plug uh, an Ethernet, a network cable, into your laptop directly and access the Internet that way. And that is always preferable if you can do it because the speeds are higher and the connection is much um, more stable and reliable. So that you, you uh, Lisa, you just opened up a whole can of worms there about wired versus wireless. Basically, I would say whenever you have the option to do so, keep things wired. And even in a portable situation, that's quite doable. I just throw the right set of cables into my backpack and I'm, I'm cool. But great, uh, great point. And please feel free, uh, chat tools, great, but please feel free uh, just to unmute yourself at any time and speak up. If you've got a, something that was great, you've got something to share or just, or have a question you want to ask, just jump in because we've got plenty of time today and we've got a small group so we can be very informal here. All right, let's see what the rest of this equipment looks like. But that's, that's the big thing. And that fits in the backpack just fine. There's the backpack. <laughs> okay. Extra cameras are something 
that you uh, probably are going to need in a high flex situation. Your laptop has a camera that will show you to your remote students, your Zoomies. And of course, the people in the classroom can see you anyway, unless you're <laughs> hiding behind the laptop. But there are going to be times when it's going to be handy to have more cameras. Um, like uh, an external webcam, that one right there, a little uh, Logitech C920 webcam is a great option for uh, an external webcam. Like most webcams, it just plugs in uh, to, the, uh, to your computer through a USB port. The, uh, it gives you the option, for instance, to show, to put that camera on your roomies, the students in the classroom. And from time to time, you can show those folks to the people at home. Indeed, a great pedagogy in, uh, or a great pedagogical activity in a high flex classroom is to stop lecturing from time to time and have the students talk back and forth to one another, maybe in a class discussion or a question and answer period or whatever. And if you have this second camera, you can put that camera on your students just a second keeping trying to find my cursor there it is <laughs> hey. right. go ahead so <clears throat> so basically you're showing how uh, a very easy cheap way of doing and working with the camera oh right. is that your lovely wife I'm sorry. <laughs> and there's, there's the my, understanding that, she's my roomie wife. today <laughs> and it is doing double duty. I don't know why this webcam does this sometimes with OBS, but uh, uh, normally it's not jittery like that. Probably because I've got about five or six different, actually, let me try a different camera here. There, that one works better. So like this is a cheap, easier way than because like if you were doing with a, a meeting owl, that right. would be that would really raise the cost. Yeah, this this eliminates the need for a meeting owl. Although it is awesome. They are nice to have. They're also here. That's that's better. There, that camera is a little more stable. We'll talk about how I'm doing that in a minute. Uh, yeah, the Meeting Owl is a wonderful combination of camera and microphones, and it will follow you around the room and things like that. It's just got one drawback. It's $1,000 all by itself. It costs as much as the laptop. It's not something that... It also, it ain't tiny. And it weighs, what, 10, 10 pounds or so all by itself. So it's not easy to move from room to room. Though if you can get a meeting owl uh, into a classroom and leave it there, that's a wonderful thing. But it's just not a sure thing. And we're trying, you said the right, you said the word, Kathy, cheap. We're trying to do this as cheaply as possible. And there are ways to do that and still be effective. Uh, okay, so multiple cameras. Also, a document camera is a wonderful thing to have so that you can uh, as an alternative to a whiteboard. Well, yeah, if you're teaching in a high flex classroom, you probably have a whiteboard hanging on the wall and you can get up and you can write on that whiteboard. But when's the last time you sat in the back of a classroom and tried to read something that somebody was writing on a whiteboard up at the front of the room? It's difficult. Um, this option makes things a lot easier for everyone to see. 
and you can And it makes it easier for you. It's easier to write on a piece of paper under a document camera than it is to write on the whiteboard. And it doesn't take you, it doesn't turn you away from your students and all that. I'm just a real big fan of virtual replacements for whiteboards. And all you need, in addition to the document camera, is a pen and a piece of paper. And this also gives you, of course, the option to put documents down and share them with your, with your class, both the people in the uh, classroom and the people at home at the same time. Uh, my wife can look over on the projected image on the wall here and see this uh, this document that I'm sharing with you and you all can see it at home and everybody can see it about as well, except that unfortunately I, I, I got lazy and I didn't bring a portable projection screen and you would have a projection screen in the classroom that would make the projector easier to see, but it's over there. This is a toy that, uh, you would not need to have. There, I'm projecting on a window screen, <laughs> so it's not ideal. I could have brought a portable screen in. It would have been easier to see. Dave? But I was lazy. Yes. Hey, yes. How much do document readers cost? I document. teach from home, but I'd like to get one. I hear you. Document cameras. Great question. About 100 bucks for one wow, and cool. one half. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad that's a wow, cool, and not a oh my god. <laughs> you know what? The school gave me a document camera to bring home. Oh, bless your heart! That's always oh. a possibility. Yeah. So I could get one from Mesa then. Maybe I would ask. Okay, it's certainly a possibility. Let's uh, let's take a look. You're asking how much did it cost, and probably as well. You probably want to know. Which one is decent? Right. My favorite by far, though it's not the only good one out there, but my favorite can be had at Amazon. Or I've bought I've bought these at Best Buy too. Walked in and bought one. Um, it's from a company called IPVO. I have no idea what that stands for, except that they sort of invented this sort of document camera. This is the one, actually, I have an earlier version of this one, but it looks just like this one. Uh, 4K Ultra High Definition 8 Megapixel USB Document Camera. It Dave, you're not in... projecting it to us. Oh, Lord, thank you very much. I'm sure not. Thank you so much. I didn't. There. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you. It's on Amazon. IPVO, I-P-E-V-O. Just go to Amazon and search for IPVO. Uh, the list price on this puppy is actually $99, not $149, I happen to know. But um, these things, early in the pandemic, you couldn't get these things at all. They were totally out of stock. The company couldn't make them fast enough. Yes, but, I remember um, attending one. I remember attending one of your presentations in March 2020. Oh, and uh, yeah. they, they were out of stock. <laughs> yeah, they were, and and if, I saw these things being offered on Amazon for two to three hundred dollars. People scalping them, so even and even then, sometimes you couldn't get them. Now they've come back down to a reasonable price. You can have one in two days if you're in San Diego. Maybe five days for me up here in northern Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you're Amazon Prime, you could have it in no time. Uh, and the that's the one I'm using here right now. It's dirt simple. You just plug it into the computer and it just works. It shows up as a video source in, in Zoom. And you can just access it and share it with your Zoomies. And if you're, you've got a projector in the room... Uh, your your roomies see what it sees as well. And Thank you. You bet. Um, 
the and it's not just a document camera of course you can put a three-dimensional object under there there's my well let me show you that go back to the document camera here thanks very much if at any time of Kathy knows at any time I um, start talking about something and it seems like I ex think that you're seeing something and you're not, please let me know right away because this is, there are a few balls in the air here. And, and by the way, I don't know if you want to said, but uh, one other good thing about a document camera, not just this one, but any kind is I'm, I don't teach biology, but I did observe someone dissect a mouse under exactly using a document camera. So even a science class could use this. Yeah, it'll, exactly. Thank you. Exactly the point I was going to make. It'll, it allows you to put three-dimensional objects under there. Like, uh, here's a little Bluetooth speaker. You can see from, compared to the size of my hand, just a handheld thing. This thing, uh, you can get speakers like this now that will fill a room with sound. So if you're sound system in your room doesn't exist in your classroom doesn't exist or uh, isn't very good you can carry this in your backpack and just throw it down on a table somewhere and it'll fill the room with sound the um so you can put three-dimensional objects under this thing as Kathy said, um, <laughs> some poor mouse is being vivisected. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, anything that the camera sees, you can share both with your roomies through the projector and your zoomies through Zoom. And it's just a video source in Zoom. So you don't even have to share your screen. You just select it as a video source in Zoom and out it goes. All right. This time I will figure out to get back to uh, here and I'm gonna minimize that. We're back to our PowerPoint slide with the video on it there. And let's continue and see what other goodies we might use here. A microphone. One of the biggest challenges in high flex instruction is sound video is actually fairly easy you can you can take care of the seeing part of uh, high flex instruction fairly easily just with having multiple cameras and switching back and forth between them in zoom but having everybody be able to hear one another is a little bit more of a challenge, particularly in one respect. It's not a big deal for everyone to hear you, which is, of course, the most important thing of all in terms of audio. They, your roomies can hear you directly. Your zoomies will hear you through the microphone in your laptop, or you may have an ex, a better external microphone that you like to use. But the real rub comes when you want your students be able to interact with one another. Roomies talking to Zoomies, Zoomies talking to Roomies. Um, that's a little bit more challenging. And that's the best solution to that in a classroom costs about $10,000. <laughs> we got a, a price tag for that. It's a, it's a microphone array that fits in uh, a drop ceiling it fits in place of a drop ceiling tile and it um, it picks up audio from all over the room from the instructor from the people in the room and uh, and transmits it through zoom to your remote students not every classroom is going to have that that's 10 times the cost of a meeting hour uh, it is possible to do pretty well 
on picking up audio from your roomies and sending it to your Zoomies. Zoomies to roomies is no problem. They all have their own microphones and their laptops or on their in their mobile devices or whatever. So it's no trouble for the Zoomies to speak to you and to the people in the room, as long as you have speakers that play what comes through Zoom. But it's a lot more challenging for the, to pick up the audio from the people in the room and send it to the uh, Zoomies, to the remote students. That's the, re that's the single biggest technical challenge in setting up a high flex classroom. Uh, there are lots of levels of solutions to that, but the simplest one and the cheapest one, and one that will work reasonably well, is what you see in uh, centered in the uh, picture right there. And I, yes, you are seeing that <laughs> looking over here. Um, that's called a boundary microphone. It's something that sits on a table or on a flat surface of some sort in order to work. It has, it's a USB connected one. That's a USB cable uh, tied up on top of it there. So it plugs, just plugs into a USB port on your computer. And you can run USB cables as far as 20, 20 feet, 30 feet or more. I've got an extension cable over in my backpack over there that will extend the reach of this thing by 20 feet and it will pick up sound over a 15 or 20 foot radius pretty well particularly if people speak up a little bit let me illustrate that let me select that as my zoom audio source here I, zoom allows me to um, to change audio sources at any time. So I'm going to change my audio source to that microphone, which I currently have hooked up. Okay. Uh, my meter tells me that I'm transmitting to you. And if I um, show my Ruby here, fair warning up there. <laughs> uh, let's see. There she is. Hello. <laughs> and Barbara, say something to us. Well, I am busy cutting up tomatoes from the garden to make homemade salsa today. Oh, great. <laughs> I wish you were here to taste it. Me too. I'm totally <laughs> jealous. None of my tomatoes really produced anything this year. Oh, I'm sorry. We had a good year. Um, well, here's the thing. Standing from here, I must be, what, 12 feet away? No, 15, you're more like 15 feet 15 away. 15 feet away, and I can hear you um, perfectly talking to me. We you're can hear you well, too. Great. That's wonderful. And you look beautiful, too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's a good sport, and uh, just one of the reasons I can never do without her. But uh, <laughs> she is my standard roomy in these uh, sessions but you can really that's what we were having a dialogue back and forth there it works and that microphone folks i paid 75 dollars for it's just not a it's not a high-end piece of professional audio equipment that runs hundreds and hundreds of dollars and it's not the best one anymore in that price range either it's one i've had for 10 years or more so it's a um and, and all I have to do to set up is just to plug a cable, uh, plug it into an extension cable and plug it into a USB port on my laptop. And it shows up as a, an audio source in Zoom uh, on my, so I just go to, let me share my Zoom screen for, with you for a second. That's a little bit different way of, of sharing this sort of thing. Well, that's it. Okay, now you're seeing my Zoom screen. So all I have to do to select that microphone is go to the little microphone icon in, the, in my Zoom menu in the lower left and click on the menu button next to it. And here are all my microphones that I have attached to this computer or they're 
audio input sources of various sorts. This, ha uh, this happens to be that microphone. I can switch back and forth between that and the microphone built into the laptop. The sound, I think, is a little better with the microphone array in the laptop for me. But if I go back to the boundary mic again, which I'm cl even closer to than Barbara is, probably, it will still pick me up pretty well. That also would give me the option, if I wanted to move around and talk to my students in the room without being ensconced behind my laptop, that microphone will pick me up as I move around the room. Hmm. Um, if I get too far away or if I don't speak up and enunciate clearly, that can get to be a problem. But that's a problem. It's no more of a problem in that way than it is for the people who insist on sitting in the back of the room. <laughs> we all have them who want to get as far away from us as they can. Of course, these days they probably have some, <laughs> some you, justification in that. Yes. You said that's a boundary, like like the boundary of something microphone. Like, um, the boundary between your your house and the neighbor. Yeah. Okay. It's called, like, would, would it be like a other kinds of mic, like a Yeti or? Yeah, you, it, it's certainly not the only kind of microphone that will pick up sound 360 degrees around and will pick it up well. Um, Kathy mentions another good option that, um, let me kill my screen share here and go back to i do love toys i've got several of them here uh, switching back and forth between them uh let me pull up a uh, there you're seeing a web browser window let's go to amazon again And I can just, uh, the microphone that um, Kathy was referring to is called a Blue Yeti. But they're for, not all blue. <laughs> but for reasons that are not apparent, because usually it's black. That's the Blue Yeti, you see there, about $130. And this one has, what's called adjustable um, pickup geometry. You can, a little knob, you can turn on it and turn it into a, what's called an omnidirectional microphone, which means it'll pick up sound equally well from any angle, wherever the sound is coming from in the room. And you could take this, it's also connects to your computer via a USB cable. And, um, you could put it put it on a USB extension, set it in the middle of the students out in the room, and it would pick them up quite well. Maybe even better than the boundary microphone. The one drawback I see to it <laughs> is that it is bigger and heavier, and more expensive than this little boundary microphone I'm using. Um, but it certainly would work very well and maybe even better in terms of audio quality. And there's a, a nano version of it, a smaller version of it. Uh, this one, which is much, it's not real obvious, but it's, it's less than half the size of the big one and the weight. And it works almost as well. <coughs> and these are by no means the only option for picking up sound from an area. Uh, that are relatively modest in cost. There are lots of microphones of this nature uh, that you can get for, you know, in around the $100 range or so. But the boundary microphone is so compact and so light that it's really easy to throw in the backpack, <laughs> which is why I use that one. All right. Yeah, my setup isn't at all portable um, because I've got I've got a 
I'm using it to also sing and, and record. Oh, cool. But, but um, I like what you're using because <clears throat> it's my classroom is a 60 person classroom. It's enormous. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that the mic they gave me does not in any way pick up even half of the room. What kind of mic did they give you? They gave me, it looks like it's a lavalier. <laughs> the, oh. It's a, a little tiny mic that they said, oh, we'll just hook it up and aim it at the class. And I'm like, it's <laughs> not picking up anything beyond the first row. I bet it's not. <laughs> but this would solve the vast majority of that. You could get this 20 to 30 feet away from you. Wow. So that it would pick up your students, even in a 60 person classroom. It wouldn't work in a 150 person lecture hall. You need other, you need a lot more expensive <laughs> solutions for that sort of thing. Microphones hanging from the ceiling everywhere and so on. But this will work surprisingly well in a, um, in a normal sized classroom. Hmm. Wow. It's certainly better than the solution they gave you. Yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. It was ridiculous. I, yeah. Like I said, last semester I was using my, I was checking in with my iPhone, my iPad, and uh, my laptop. Right. So that I could give different pieces to students to use for group work. Bless your heart, yeah. But, but also so that they could hear, I could station them further back so they could actually hear better. Lisa, what do you teach with 60 students? Is it art or music? Uh, physical geography. Physical geography. That's too many students. Oh, in no. ah. That's another issue. Oh, yes. But, but I, yeah. I kind of, my numbers keep the, um, keep the, the labs, the 12, the tw uh, 20 person, 25 person labs, and some of the smaller labs, the 12 person labs, in the right mix for our FTE. So, yeah. 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 You should see our physics classes. You should get paid twice. I wish. <laughs> yeah. But this this is a very inexpensive and very easy to implement solution. Um, and there are better boundary microphones than this if you find you need a little bit better. And that meeting owl that uh, Kathy mentioned earlier, which I suppose I should show. So everybody knows what we're talking about here. Because yeah. I think that's the problem that some people have because it is a little more technical, but I, I loved it and used it and the students loved it. The one day I got to use it. Yeah. They call it that for a reason. <laughs> it's easy enough to see. And Let's see. Let us show. Come on, show us what it looks like. Zoom the crickets. Ah, there it is. There's the device. It's got a camera in it. It's got a, a microphone array. You can walk around the room. It will follow you. The camera will follow you, and it will pick up. They claim fifteen to twenty foot radius. It'll pick up sound and it does quite well yeah but it's a thousand it's yeah thousand and fifty dollars um versus 75 dollars you're going to be able to outfit a lot more classrooms with something like this than you will with meeting owls and the meeting owls too big and too fragile to carry around effectively I mean, you can carry it from room to room, but you can't throw it in the backpack and go anywhere. Well, but if I'm writing a HERF request for uh -huh. equipment, is it better to get that meeting owl? Oh, if you I can, can get it, absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would love to have one sitting here on the table with me. Okay. My yeah, wife like is... the, it picks up the, just like it's, it does this, it like moves to where the sound is. And so if you have one, like you have 60 students. So if one student, if you're is doing a presentation, then you can hear them talking and the ones at home consume. And then they have a, I don't know if you saw in that picture, but it looked, you could see like there's like a group, they only had three people, but 
it makes a curved, like at the top is the whole classroom. And have you ever seen where they make a whole classroom that looks kind of curved or concave, I guess it's it is? A, yeah, it's a pano, a, a, a um, pano, 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 panoramic, panoramic camera, right? Panoramic camera, yeah. And yeah, they, they gave me a, a swivel table to put my laptop on so that <laughs> close. Well, move the laptop around. Well, that's actually a rather clever solution yeah. to getting by with a single camera, but there's no real need because the cameras are not that expensive. That um, the well, we'll we'll see more about that in a minute. But this is a, a marvelous device. If I could have one, I'd certainly want one. And especially if you have group projects, I mean, it's, I mean, it's easy for people to say reschedule, but you can't reschedule. It's not fair to the other students who are doing that work to reschedule for those two or three that have a legitimate reason not to. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the, but you don't have to spend that kind of money yeah. to get, to make it work. But I'd love to have it. my wife's, a very understanding lady. She's a saint. <laughs> and she allows me to buy all sorts of toys. But that's why she drew the line. She has to draw the line somewhere, right? <laughs> the line is well on the wrong side of that particular um, uh, piece. Is equipment. that called an owl lab? Or is it like a name brand? No, it's called a meeting owl. No, no, no. I noticed in the sign on that picture that you showed, it said Owl Labs. That's the name of the company. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So let's talk some more. This is great, great uh, discussion. Keep it going, please. All right. Let's, uh, whoops. Right. Let's somehow rewound there. This is a short video, but there's no point in seeing all of it twice. Come on, that's enough of that. <laughs> oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Another so camera option. Your smartphone. Um, the or iPad or Android tablet can be used as a camera. That's what I was showing you, Barbara, on a moment ago. Let me see if that one's still still with me. Yeah, there it is. That's my iPhone, and held in the jaws of a little tripod adapter. My pan tilt zoom camera here. This is not one that this is neither portable nor not neither especially portable or especially affordable and cost almost as much as the meeting owl. But this was one I got away with one dark night. There's my iPhone held in the jaws of a little adapter that costs about 10 bucks on top of a little tripod that costs about 20 bucks. And that's one of my cameras. And that camera is wireless. I'm using an app on the iPhone. You load a driver on your laptop. It works on PC or Mac. And um, your high quality camera in your smartphone, that's probably the that smartphone camera is probably the best one I own. Or the best one I have in use today. And it gives you a very nice um, full color, very high resolution camera that you can just move around and it's totally wireless so you can carry it around the room and show things in the uh, in other places in the classroom if you have a an exhibit or a, an, a demonstration set up somewhere you can carry that camera around or you can carry it around and show different students while they're talking and so on if you're if you want to get a little kinesthetic in your high flex teaching and the app, I think, cost me seven bucks. The smartphone, I have any for other reasons. 
So you can get tripods from 99 cent store for $1.99 up to $5.99. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to put my iPhone 13 yeah. on that tripod. <laughs> not $1.99. It does, it does fall apart after a while. Yeah. To. <laughs> but uh, you can certainly get a little tripod like that. And that little tripod, that gives you a great uh, video production uh, tool as well. And it, it eliminates the handshaking and so on when you're, uh, when you're trying to shoot video and record video for your students using your smartphone, which is one of the best way there, ways there is to do it. So that's uh, another thing that's in this kit. Well, that's in my pocket. I keep the the little adapter. There's the little adapter that ho that's another adapter that will hold the uh, smartphone in place on a tripod and the, um, oops, I'm, I'm on the wrong screen again, sorry. You're still seeing Barbara up there. Wait, Barbara. Hello again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, here's what I'm talking about. Here's the uh, the smartphone and the tablet and the little adapt and another type of little adapter. This one costs six dollars. That will put it on top of a tripod and hold it safe. Oh. I slowed this down more than I needed to, obviously. All right. I've been uh, another thing that uh, you need from time to time is decent lighting if your students are going to be able to see you. Uh, that's especially important if you happen to like me today, having to be um, uh, sitting in front of a window. And um, if I didn't have lighting, this is what we'd be talking about. Okay. Significant difference. Really helps if they can see you. Uh, this is probably not going to be a big thing in a cl most classrooms. But it is uh, something, if you happen to be using this kit uh, somewhere other than a classroom. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have very good lighting today because I'm in the off, uh, class, I'm in an office on campus. I hear you. This is a little lighting kit. Cost uh, 40 bucks, two quite nice bright LED lights. Uh, here's what it looks like. Zoom out here. We won't tell my wife how much that camera costs. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's the, uh, yeah, there's that light. You can see it's quite bright. Uh, two of them, two tripods, cost 40 bucks on um, Amazon. And they don't require a separate power supply. If they're running off the power supply of the, they're running off the laptop. They're taking power from the laptop through a USB port. And I could have a second one there. I just didn't, didn't get around to hooking a second one up. So that's a nice touch. Again, not so important in the high flex classroom, perhaps. Steve, yes. you said that a lot of those things, they don't need an extra outlet, which is sometimes Correct. a problem. They're all running off your laptop. Right. So like you would probably need a, I forgot what you call it, the, the high powered hub or something. Because a lot of laptops, they don't put a lot of USB ports on them. Look at the screen. <laughs> exactly. Oops, I'm sorry. Wrong screen again, my bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was the next thing. No laptop has enough USB ports to do all this stuff. Windows um, 7 did. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe some of the old ones. But still, if you have four or five, you're doing amazing. So um, this doesn't hurt your computer? Even not at all. Doesn't hurt it at all. 
the hub plugs into one of your um, the, the, this device, a, a USB hub plugs into your lap into one of the lap the USB ports on your laptop, and it turns it into this particular one that had one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ports, eight USB ports on it. I'm actually using a different one now. It's a little better that has 10. Cost a little more. The, the one you're looking at was about 30 bucks. Uh, the one I've got now is about 80. And it's a, it, a little more functional. It has 10 ports on it. You can get them with 15 ports on Though, so if you can keep up with that many peripheral devices in the middle of a live session, you're a better person than I am. <laughs> The um, but a hub is going to a powered hub is going to be essential. Notice that the hub has a has a power supply, a plug in, a transformer. You could use it without that, but I strongly recommend um, plugging it in. So, but that's the only other plug I'm using right now. Power plug I'm using right now. I have the. Uh, hub plugged in and I have the computer plugged in rather than relying on its battery alone because the battery would not last for two hours. But it's, so it's just two plugs. So all I have to take with me is an extension cord with two plugs on the end. I just bought one at Home Depot. 10 bucks, <clears throat> that's probably 20, 20 feet long. It allows, it gives me a lot of flexibility about how to set up in the classroom. This will allow me to plug any reasonable number of USB devices in. And since it's powered, it will supply power to those devices. But I have tried this out. <laughs> I've tried out something, I should say, uh, which I'm not going to try out right now because I don't want to interrupt what we're doing. But I have um, unplugged everything when I had all this set up and run everything off the laptop battery. Now, uh, this laptop has the biggest battery that you can fly with. So it's a quite a good sized lithium ion battery. In the built into the laptop, but I've had this laptop last about 50 minutes with all this stuff drawing power from it. So, theoretically, at least, you can run this whole setup from the laptop battery alone. I don't recommend it unless you're planning on a very short session <laughs> and you don't have any other option. Usually, in a classroom, you'll at least have a wall plug or hopefully a plug on the podium where you're teaching from a power plug. But this will allow you to plug all of this stuff in. And it's a very handy thing to have. Okay. Then I got some little tripods to put my camera on, my um, smartphone on, my lighting panel on, and some cables. You're going to have to have some wires. <laughs> I need to speed this up in places. I was anticipating talking over it. And of course, to make the whole thing portable. Oh, let's go back one. I'm not using it today, but... You can also include in this a green screen for better virtual backgrounds and so on and Zoom. 
and that's all you need. If you're going to set this up in a classroom and have it stay in place for a semester, say. This is a, it's very easy to put a green screen behind you. It gives you all sorts of fun um, display options. You can put yourself anywhere in the world, things like that. Uh, for your zoomies anyway, and your roomies can look up at the projected image on the wall and, and see that. And that's all you really have to have to set up a green screen. That's a piece of non-woven fabric of chroma key green, they call it, which unfolds into a big enough background that you can realistically use it if you're setting up the podium that will cover the entire area behind you. And all you have to do is tack it to the wall or, or tape it to the wall. It, uh, the chroma key, the chroma keyer technology in Zoom and in uh, other, uh, other systems is so good these days that you don't have to have something that's perfectly smooth or um, you know, perfectly lighted or anything like that. It'll work just fine. And so that's my green screen. And that was 10 bucks. That piece of fabric was 10 bucks. So that's how that figures in. I'm not using that today, and you don't have to use that. Certainly, you probably wouldn't use it in a high flex classroom because it's just you're probably going to be moving around too much to really want to stand, keep standing in front of the green screen. And then, of course, finally, if you are going to move this from classroom to classroom, you're going to want a way to pack it all up and take it with you. And this little $65 backpack from Amazon does that beautifully. I've got a, a an equipment list that I'll share with you here before we finish that has what I bought in it. It's certainly not the only set of equipment you might use in a situation like this. But this has proven to be a very good, reliable, tough backpack. I've traveled all over the country. With this thing. And um, with my stuff in it, and all this technology has survived. It's got a padded, it's designed for a laptop. So it's got a padded compartment for the laptop, but it's also got a compartment that will fit the monitor and all the other stuff will fit in the pockets and so on. The whole thing when it's packed up weighs about 20 pounds. So it's well within the limit for a carry-on luggage uh, on an airliner. And it's, it's a little bit of a, yeah, I, if I had it to do over, I might have gotten myself one that had wheels on the bottom and a, and a handle on the top so I could drag it along behind me. But I, I just take this one and throw it on top of a suitcase when I'm traveling and strap it to the suitcase and it, it works fine. But it is, it is getting to be a little bit of a challenge to get it into the overhead bin on the airplane, but you can usually find some kind young Marine or somebody traveling with you who will throw it up there for you. Uh, and this makes this whole setup that we've been talking about here today portable. So it's really easy to move it from classroom to classroom. Though ideally, what you'd probably want to do, if you're going to be teaching in the same classroom all semester and you're going to be using equipment like this, is to just leave most of it set up. None of it is that expensive, except for the laptop. I'd unplug the laptop and lock it up or carry it away with me in the backpack or whatever, but everything else, uh, the individual components, none of them are especially or terribly irreplaceable or expensive. So it's probably worth the risk just to leave them set up if you're gonna be teaching. And again, the total cost of the equipment I've shown you so far, including the laptop, is under still under $2,000. Even this nice laptop is under $2,000 as opposed to the tens of thousands of dollars you sometimes see uh, put into a high flex classroom. And quite frankly, in many ways, it works just as well. All right. So what's it take to set this up? Let's say 
you do have to take set this up and take it down. This is what it, once it's laid out on the table, this is about what it takes. This, in real time, this was about 15 minutes. If with practice, you could probably get it down to 10 because the, there aren't that many components, not that many cables. There's the, there's the hub just plugged into a USB port. And I've got some power on the floor <laughs> plugging in. There's my, uh, my boundary microphone. Here's my little, that's probably the hardest thing to do is get that webcam on top of the uh, tripod. The webcam involved, I mentioned that it was a Logitech C920. I picked that one, A, because it's an industry standard. It's been out for 10 years and people are still using it. It's still one of the most commonly used laptop. There are, there are newer versions of it that uh, look about the same, that have slightly upgraded electronics and so on, but it's still a great one. And, but the reason I'm using it here above all else is that it has a tripod screw on the bottom of it. that allows you to fasten it to the tripod. Um, and not all webcams have that, obviously. And here's another one. This is the one that uh, my smartphone is going to go on. Is there a reason you keep some of those things in the plastic bag just for safety or convenience? Okay. If they if they were just floating around loose in the bottom of the laptop at the bottom of the bag, bottom of the backpack, it would take a lot longer. There's my lighting, I just put, and bingo, and I'm set up. Like I say, that, that took me the first couple of times about 15 minutes. So if you had to do that every day, it'd be a bit of a pain. So uh, what I would hope you would be able to do is just take the laptop with you and leave everything else so because no one piece of it is that expensive. And there's more expensive equipment probably in the classroom than, than this. But you can, if you were like presenting at a conference or something like that, you could reasonably set this up in the interval between two sessions. All right. Operation, well, we've been talking about uh, how to use, we've been illustrating how to use this all along, but uh, just make a point here, you can do this with just the soft, these be software on the laptop, all you really need is Zoom. Zoom allows you, as we saw, to select different audio sources. So if you wanna switch between microphones, you can do that. You can even, though that's an advanced technique, we have tutorials for it, but you can even utilize a software-based microphone mixer, which is just a way to let you have more than one microphone active at the same time. You can use, you can use a virtual mixer, mixer, or you can get little hardware-based mixers that will allow you to plug your microphones in and have more than one microphone active at the same time. And you can adjust the relative volume coming from each microphone at the same time. So you can have multiple microphones active at the same time, but that adds another level of complexity, another level of technology that you have to deal with. Quite frankly, just switching audio sources in Zoom works pretty well. We saw how to do that earlier. You can also select different video sources in Zoom. So I can, take video from my, my, the camera in my laptop that's pointed at me, or I can switch to a, a different camera. I can switch to my external webcam or my smartphone camera or my document camera, and I can go back and forth between them in Zoom. Again, 
that's just a menu in Zoom. I share my Zoom screen. It's the little menu right next to the camera in the Zoom menus, the Zoom host menu. And I have all these different cameras attached that I can switch between. I'm not gonna switch between them using Zoom because if I do, things will, I'll, I'll have a problem right now because I'm not using Zoom to switch video sources right now. I'm using the other option you see on the screen here. I'm using Open Broadcaster Studio. Let me share that screen again. Open Broadcaster Studio is a software-based video studio that allows me to feed the output of this video studio to Zoom through something called a virtual camera. In, in my Zoom, on my Zoom screen, I have selected in my Zoom video options, I have selected what's called the OBS virtual camera. So the output from this virtual studio is what you're seeing and what you've been seeing all along in Zoom. But that's another added, whoop, 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 sorry, I was done. I just about did the wrong thing there. Um, but OBS gives you so much more capability. It's how I'm showing myself and my slide at the same time. Um, or I can show my external webcam and me at the same time, or my smartphone and me, my document camera and me, my this camera that I'm using to show you what's on the table and me all at the same time. And there are lots of other tricks I can play with OBS that uh, just make it easier, quite frankly, to carry on a Zoom meeting. I, this is my, I, I run all of my meetings this way. OBS is free. It takes about two hours to learn to set it up and use it. And we offer um, seminars on that periodically. And it's about time for, I think, yeah, I'm going to be offering another one next month in October. <laughs> next month is tomorrow. My God. Yeah. I, and um, it allows you to do things like composited scenes, which are what you're seeing here, where multiple video sources can be displayed and sent to Zoom at the same time and mixed together, composite. Um, just makes life a lot easier. And it makes it possible to do something like show you how to use this portable kit through Zoom without having you being able to stand around the table and look at it. I can show it to you by just selecting my, my pan tilt zoom camera that I can control with a with a wireless remote and I can move that around. So Steve? Yes, please. Is there a class about this on Absolutely. the archives? There sure is. Not only is there a are there actually there are several. We've done this several times, but there's something better. Uh, let's see. I'm here. Yeah, I've still got time. Keep those questions coming. You know, Y'all are doing great. Okay. Uh, nope, you're not seeing that. It is a. It does take a little practice to keep up with what you're actually showing your attendees <laughs> using this. Uh, that's why I, I I always ask people to let me know if I'm talking about something you can't see because that's all too easy to have that happen. But uh, if we go to our open on demand site at sdccd.olvid.org, let me put that in the Zoom chat. 
And I put this link in every email that I send. It's in my email signature. So hopefully you'll never miss that or never be without that. Uh, let's see, where did we put that check? Well, there it is. <laughs> Let me put that in there. It's called Open On Demand. Something that uh, Katie Palacios and I put out, geez, must be 10 years ago. And we're still keeping it up. But that's what you're seeing here. And uh, the Oops. On this site, you have workshop archives in the top menu bar, which are our recordings of all these sessions. This one will be there sometime in the next few days. Uh, we've got 34 dozen, hundreds of recordings on there that you can look at. But for OBS, and there are several OBS seminars on there, recordings of thereof. But if you just search for OBS, Open Broadcaster Studio, this is the one you want using Open Broadcaster Software Studio. This is okay. a series of tutorials that in aggregate take up a lot less than two hours that will show you how to acquire, install, set up, and use OBS with Zoom or others. You can actually also use it to record. You can even use it to live stream if you want to become your own TV person. Did I mention it's free? It's <laughs> one of the best open source projects in the world if you're into video. Uh, it's mainly used by people who like to stream their gameplay to other people. And some other people can watch them play games. Don't ask me. I, I'm not quite sure what the fascination is, but there's an entire community of people worldwide who do this. But it's also a wonderful instructional thing. And did I mention it's free? It does take a little time and probably some a few questions to get it working right. But by now, once you get it working right, you will impress your students with it. You'll impress your colleagues with it. You never know when something like that might come in handy. <laughs> yes, it might indeed. When they're getting ready to divide the smithereen of phrases and so on, <laughs> it might come in handy. But it's, and it also just makes life so much easier. And you can do so much more with Zoom and in the classroom with OBS than you can without. So that's a that's definitely worth learning to use, um, and it's fun. It's a it's one of the best toys, best probably is the best free toy I think I've ever had. So that's what I'm that's what I've been using to present to you all along. Oh, and it has chroma key capability built in. So if I had my green screen behind me, I could be anywhere in the world. And I could show myself interacting with the background uh, if I had an instructional video or a, a still image or something behind me, I can interact with it in real time. I can be the weather person, right? When the weather person on the evening news stands in front of that weather map and points things out to you, they're not standing in front of a weather map, they're standing in front of a green screen. And the weather map is digitally keyed in behind them, and they have a monitor over on the side where they can see themselves and the, and the weather map at the same time. 
and they're why they're looking over there occasionally and then when they're pointing and so on it it's quite a hand-eye coordination thing it, it takes a lot of practice to to, to uh, ride the screen they call it but it's something you can do with obs and that ten dollar piece of green fabric and a halfway decent webcam um you can do that too and it, we have seminars where we just talk about the chroma key or green screen technology as well. But that's not really necessary for high flex. <laughs> okay. So. I, I have a question about the computer. Wonderful. Um, well, first off, at school, they gave me a MacBook. Yeah. So would it, could you, well, I guess you'd get a different connection to put it into these US yeah, MacBooks. Book. MacBook work great. Um, the you're right. The connectors may be a little different, um, and so getting it set up the first time will be uh, will may involve buying a cable or two or an adapter or two. But certainly the MacBook will work. Um, if the MacBook has only one. USB-C or uh, Thunderbolt port on it, they call it, you're going to have to buy uh, some adapters. <laughs> and you may also need what's called an HDMI splitter. Let me show you that. That's a great question. Something I should have already dealt with. I gotta go back to OBS here and pull up it allow obs allows me to select different video sources i'm going to pull up my just my primary camera here so i can hold this thing up and show it or better yet i'll put it on the document camera what am i thinking about All right there's the document camera <laughs> the device i'm talking about is just a tiny little um little box I think this one costs about 35 bucks. It's got US, it's got a power connector, a USB input port on one side, and this one's a one a two port splitter. So it's got a, a two port, it's got two HB, uh, HDMI output ports on the other side. You run your from your MacBook, you have a cable that went from a USB-C connector to an HDMI or high density multimedia interface, the same the TV connector, your digital TV connector. This is what you use to hook your, um, your Roku box, your Apple TV or your DVD player now to your Blu-ray player to your TV. Well, you, you run the output from the computer into the input here, and then you get two outputs. Two, and you plug HDMI cables into those. One of those goes into your projector, and the other one goes into your second monitor. Uh, if you're running a two monitor setup like we've got here. Well, so I, I have an iPad, and uh, so the iPad would be my, my second monitor. Oh. Would that work? It sure will, and that simplifies things considerably, because the iPad will can will serve as a monitor to a Mac, the second monitor to a MacBook wirelessly using air, what's called AirPlay. You don't have to plug the iPad into the the MacBook uh, physically to have its function as a second monitor, and that's an ideal solution. Because you probably have the iPad for other reasons, especially if you got one of the one of the ten inch diagonal, the big iPads, that would make a very practical second model. Eight. iPad Mini, maybe not so much. So that solves that problem. Then you just use the what you do with the MacBook. Then with the with the um, Thunderbolt port on the MacBook is you plug a Thunderbolt hub. Or a USB hub that it maybe has both standard USB ports and Thunderbolt ports on it 
into your laptop, and then you've got all those connectors that you can use to plug your peripherals in. No MacBook is going to have enough USB ports on it to plug all this stuff in. So you're going to need a hub anyway. You just need a slightly different hub than the one I have here with the Windows PC. And there are lots of them available out there. And I can, I can help with that uh, if you run it, if you decide you want to set that up. <laughs> I, can, I can give you some options, or I'm sure you can find them yourself as well, but I'd be happy to help. Dave? Yes. All right. So that splitter is powered, right? Yes. It, yeah, it has to be. Okay. So, like, it's similar to, like, is it the like the RCA cable, but on a TV where it's not powered, it's like a little, like a little looks like pipes <laughs> that are connecting our tubes, and you just screw them in, so it works the same way, but powered though. Yeah, it needs power, <laughs> it needs power to drive the HDMI signal. Okay, uh, that, that's a power hungry little devil. So but that's optional. Oh, that's very, uh, I'm not using it here. My laptop, one of the reasons I picked this one, has um, two external video ports on it. And that's not too unusual with higher end laptops. It has the Thunderbolt port, the little USB, the little oval, tiny oval port. Oh, is that what that's and, called? That I'm little sorry? zigzag <laughs> called the Thunderbolt? That is, you're talking about that little zigzaggy thing? Yeah, yeah, the little lightning bolt thing. Lightning bolt, oh, okay. So this laptop came with a, uh, a Thunderbolt port and an HDMI out on it. So I have a cable going from the, my HDMI port on the laptop to the projector over here. Let me uh, show that. Okay. I can't, the HDMI cable is in behind the thing here, right there. There's the HDMI out. Hopefully you saw that. I had to move the screen out of the way, I couldn't tell. But uh, then that runs directly over to my projector here. And the for the second monitor here, there's a single cable, this little, this is the USB-C cable, a little oval connector like the, uh, the modern Android phones have on them. And that goes around to the back, again, to, uh, to a Thunderbolt port on the back of the computer. So I don't have to use a splitter. There's a, in effect, the computer is um, acting as a splitter itself. So it gives me two external outputs, one to the, the video outputs, one to the um projector and one to my second one but if i didn't have that i could if i just had say an hdmi out and nothing else on this laptop i could run that through a splitter and i could get two outputs and i could plug one hdmi cable into this and the other one into the projector and it would work fine so um there are lots of options, but yes, this will certainly work with a MacBook. It would also work with a uh, with a Mac Mini, a little pizza box computer from Apple. The only drawback to that one is you also have to have a keyboard and a monitor, but monitors you can carry with you easily enough. This monitor. That I'm using right here would work fine for that. It would plug in, and the Mac Mini has the same uh, same ports that I have on this PC laptop here. It has a Thunderbolt out, and it has an HDMI out, so I can plug one into the projector and one into the uh, into the second monitor. And the MacBook with a um, You could adapt the MacBook also to be able to do that. So this will work fine. You could do this with either a, um, a MacBook or a Mac Mini or uh, heaven for 
if you can get one of the new Mac studios, the, the bigger um, external or bigger pizza box computers that are from Apple that are just immensely powerful now. Um, you could set this kind of uh, high flex kit up with any of those computers as a as the core of the system. And if you if you're in that situation, if you have the MacBook and you um, want to know what you need to set something like this up, just send me the information on the MacBook, or maybe show me the port, take a picture of the ports on the MacBook, and I'll be happy to make some suggestions for you. I love to do, and I love stuff like, I love hooking things together and making things work, especially if it's, uh, in ways perhaps that they weren't originally intended to do, <laughs> and you could still get it to work. So I'd love okay. to help with that. The school gave me, this is new from them, an uh -huh. HP, I don't know if I can show you this, no. Uh, let me get you back on the screen here. Let's see, and let me take off my background here. Um, none. Okay. okay. They gave me this. Okay, I'm, I'm pulling you up just a second. And let me spotlight you for everyone so everybody can see. Hold just a second. Okay, now. This. Oh my gosh, that's kind of like a Mac Mini, yeah. Only a PC. Okay, so is this... Um... It has all kinds of plugs on it, and they said, oh, yeah. you plug anything into it. And I'm like, for what reason? And does it power everything? I mean, I don't understand. Yeah, probably. probably. It's, it is new, and it's real exciting. They gave it to me, but they gave oh, it to me with cool. zero explanation. Oh, boy. Oh, that's a fascinating little device. Um, you probably really want that one. Probably doesn't have a huge power supply in it. Well, I would strongly recommend a. Uh, oh, next you. I would strongly recommend a powered hub, like uh, the one that I showed you earlier. Is that that that's goes the with power it. supply for it? Yeah. So yeah. that's that's a pretty good size power supply. I don't think you'll have any trouble. All right. That, so this would run supply. the stuff. Oh, this would do all of this. And it gosh, weighs a ton. A ton yeah, it weighs I a ton. Feel. It's got a ton of ports on it, too. Probably. Now, the only drawback with this one, if you're going to set it up as a portable kit, I mean, obviously, it starts off great, <laughs> tiny, but you'd need a keyboard, of course, for it, a couple of keyboards. And oh, you're going to really? probably, if you want two monitors, you're going to have to have two of these um, portable monitors that I showed you. So suddenly, and those aren't free. So, but if you're setting it up in a situation where you could leave it set up, you could just use a standard computer monitor. And I'm sure it has a, um, I'm almost certain it probably has a, a more than one monitor port on. Yeah, um, it's, they gave me one monitor uh -huh. and um, they said it would work with my MacBook. And that's. Yeah. So I was just trying to figure out how. <laughs> uh, it will. Um, I'm get uh, Windows 10 and 11 have uh, a way to wirelessly use other uh, laptops as screens. So you could use your MacBook as a secondary screen for the HP. Um, that's pretty cool. That is a very nice piece of equipment. For, particularly for the sort of thing that we're talking about here, uh, where if you want to mobilize it, <clears throat> like I probably wouldn't want to leave that sitting in the classroom, but it'd be very easy just to set everything up. And then at the end of the day, you just unplug that and carry it away with you and bring it back and plug it in, take one minute and then you'd be back up and running. And you're not having to haul around a lot of equipment, yet it has, um, I bet it has a pretty good sized uh, solid state hard drive in it so that uh, you know you can keep your files stored on it and all that. Um, would you mind, I'm fascinated 
Uh, would you mind sending me the model number on that or an email? Uh, I'd love to look at it. And uh, I can maybe give some, um, in terms of setting up this sort of thing, I could give you some suggestions on the different uh, cables and adapters you might need and so on. Is that a projector, Lisa? That, um, I mean, a monitor? No, projector, that little square thing. You know, um, it's they called it a hub, oh, <laughs> and okay. and I don't know what it is because they really gave me no explanation. They just handed me boxes, so I've got a a monitor, and this, and a, a MacBook, and a uh, oh, an iPad. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. No, that may not be a, a separate computer then. I have seen complete computers. That says, but it sounds like that's probably just a hub. Then. Um, it's got. But, uh, but you'd, you'd said it had. I see it because it has all these plugs on it. Yeah, that's that's, that's a. In that event, yeah, it's got all those different plugs on it. So that's a multi, multi, um, modal hub that you would just plug into the one of the US B ports on your laptop or in your MacBook. That way you don't have to have everything plugged into the wall. That's what that Dave was talking about, the hub. Okay. Well, no, you don't have it, you don't have to have it plugged into USB ports on your MacBook. This gives you multiple USB ports. I was I was getting excited there. I I have seen complete computers that size. That would be nice. That, I thought it was a projector that was really small. Like that, well, like the Mac, the Mac Mini is basically that it's just a little bit bigger than that thing you showed me hmm. and it's a complete wow. computer but um no oh, wow but i still if, if you don't mind if you could send me the the model number on that i'll look at it and i'll and i'll have a better idea of exactly what capability it has and uh what else you might need to set up this kind of uh, functionality that we've been talking about today yeah, because there's there's no other cables that came with it. Yeah, and, you're probably going to have to add some cables yeah. and maybe an adapter or two. But those yeah. are, those are all very available. So it uh, it's just a matter of figuring out how to hook it up. And I'd love to love to help if you. Thank uh, you. All right. And uh, just in case, here's my email address. Actually, let me keep my district email address. So, Gibber so no in. <laughs> when I went to the district, when I came to the district, they didn't. They were too poor to give us more than eight characters, so <laughs> and that ends up with emails being missed sometimes. But uh, if you send me that, I I love to look into that and see what else you might need to create this kind of setup. All right, um, let's see, well, packing up, uh, um, I'll, I'll assume you can figure out that it's, all of this equipment does in fact fit into that backpack. I guess we've got a moment here. Packing it up actually takes less time than setting it up. You don't have to watch this whole thing. I have spent it. It takes about 10 minutes to pack it back up. But I like that music that would be do 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 But it swallows all of it. The secret ingredient there's a couple of old socks that the document camera and the uh, webcam go into so they don't get scratched but it all fits including the green screen and all three tripods and all three tripods and it goes over your back 
and away you go. And again, if you can find a nice young Marine to help you throw it up into the uh, uh, overhead bin on the airliner, that is, that um, backpack is sized to be legal for the overhead bin. And it's well within the uh, weight limit, which I think is like 35 pounds in most cases. And that's it. <laughs> that's everything I had for you today. Some great questions so far. How about some more? There it is. Set up and run. And that's obviously that's what I've been using today to run this session. And quite frankly, there's, there's little to nothing I can do in my studio where I have a big desktop computer and multiple monitors and um, permanent installation. There's very little, if anything, I can do in there that I can't do with this set and set up that I can carry around in the backpack or that I can carry from classroom to classroom and set up. And as you saw, talking to Barbara there and so on, you can really do high flex instruction with just this much equipment. Oh, I was going to share with you the um, equipment. Basically a dozen pieces of equipment. Yeah, in that range. In that range. Let's see here, let me get my... Actually, that's not what I want to do. I want Word. Or Excel. Got this in the spreadsheet. There it is. Okay, here's the equipment list. Let me see if I can share that with you. Office 365. <laughs> uh, people, anyone with the link, want to share it so anyone with the link can view it. I don't want to just anybody editing it. There we go. Copy the link. That's all there is to sharing a document in Office 365 with your students or your colleagues. Now I just need to go to Zoom and put that in the chat. There's chats. Can we use that even if we if were using a Mac? I mean, I know my Mac oh, yeah. usually defaults to my cloud, my iCloud. Oh, absolutely. You mean Office 365? Right. I, I, I asked because um, my Office computer <clears throat> is. Uh, what was uh, about seven years old, maybe eight, and uh -huh. right, it's no, it no longer, it can't use any of this. It can't right. access the cloud or anything. It's having a terrible time. But my, uh, my the MacBook they gave me to teach at home and and right. that sort of thing has been remarkable, <laughs> just remarkable. Mm -hmm. But does do we have access to the Microsoft? Absolutely. 365. Absolutely. Um, all you have to do is go to the website, the IT website that I gave you for uh, the Office 365, and there's a button labeled My Apps. And you click on that, and your the apps, the Microsoft apps that you have access to, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and a bunch of others. Um, come up and you just click on one of them and it runs on the Mac just as well as it does on the PC. One thing you will have to do to, um, to get it working with your Mac is to load the OneDrive app from the Mac App Store. Uh, that doesn't come pre-installed on 
Macintosh computers as it does on Windows computers. So uh, you do have to install the MacBook. I am working on a tutorial for that right now. I'll have that online in a few days. Uh, but it's not rocket science. Just know that in order to really use the uh, the Office 365, you're going to have to be you're going to need to be able to access OneDrive, which is Microsoft's cloud storage, like your um, your iCloud storage on the Mac, uh, or Google Docs, you know, Google Drive, I should say, Google Drive or any number of other type of cloud storage operations. But the, the one that comes with Office, or the one that works with Office 365 is called OneDrive. It's a Microsoft product, obviously. And you have, by virtue of being a, uh, an employee at the district, you have one terabyte of cloud storage uh, in, one, in your OneDrive, a thousand gigabytes, which is probably enough to last us for the rest of our lives. So <laughs> it's it's quite generous. So with that proviso, uh, yes, you can absolutely use that on the MacBook. It'll work a lot better on the MacBook than it will on your old computer and uh, your old office computer. And it's just as functional on the Mac as it is on the Windows PC. Dave? I started what? using it on the Mac, yes. Yeah, you sent an email, speaking, since you're talking about Office 365, and you sent an email uh, with the video or a link to the video where you did a, 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 a presentation on Office yes. 365. I did That's one a, of these two-hour sessions, yeah. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at it, but it was during my class, so I couldn't go. But Not is here. that something we can share with our students? Of course. Okay. Nothing kind of, because the students have the same access to Office 365 that you do. As a matter of fact, they may have a better level of access than you did. Because Microsoft, when they were setting up, when IT was setting all this up, and they said, well, you know, we'd like students to have access as well. And Microsoft said, no problem, because they're seeing all these future customers. <laughs> so they gave, for the same price, they gave all of our students access to, Office, to what's called the A5 level of Office 365, which is the Cadillac level. And I, for instance, got the free level, <laughs> which is A1, which is, which is still very functional, but not nearly as nice. So the students may have better access than you do to Office 365. So yes, please feel free to share that with the students. So like make a copy of the link and- uh, Send it to them in an email or put it in Canvas. In Canvas, yeah. yeah. You're more than welcome to do that. Those, that uh, what we put on that open on demand site is completely available to anybody anywhere in the world. Oh, I didn't know students could use it. Oh yeah, there's, as a matter of fact, there's a section on there just for students. Where yeah, we that's what I thought. I thought the just for students was just for students. I didn't know. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. Anybody can access any of it. Okay. We just grouped some stuff. We, we pulled some stuff out that would have been particularly appropriate or germane to student needs, but they can look at anything. They can look at the workshop archives, anything. Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah. And, um, uh, we have, I'm probably going to add a, an Office 365 tutorial category as well and group those together so they'll be a little easier to find. But absolutely, share anything from this site with anybody you wish. It's, it is not restricted in any way. Okay, great question. All right, where was I going with that? Um, okay, I guess that's it. How about another question? Do you know the different rules for using HyFlex? I think that's the problem we're having on our campus. On well, now that that's something different. Evolve okay. over time. Okay. Um, 
but this is just a technical. Not every institution is offering classes in high flex mode at this point. It started off in a big way at the district with continuing education. They started a major pilot a couple of years ago on doing this because it's especially valuable to them with their student population. And they've been teaching all sorts of different stuff in the high flex mode. Uh, started with um, uh, English as a second language, believe it or not, which is pretty challenging to teach in that mode. And um, they're having great success with it. And they're filling classes that wouldn't have <laughs> filled otherwise. So it's- Yeah, they're using uh, it at Cal State, the UCs. Uh, yeah, this is this is a nationwide um, movement because for the students, it's really the best instructional modality that there is because it gives them maximum access to learning. And they can sit in the classroom if that's their thing. They can do it at home if that's their thing. They can... They can attend the synchronous sessions or they can watch the recordings later. They can pull information off a of canvas or, you know, they, they, they can make the learning environment fit their proclivities and their needs. And it, um, you know, it just gives them the flexibility so that almost anyone can learn and not be limited by disability or immobility or inability to access it, you know, to get to class, to have the time during the day to take classes and so on. They can do, uh, this can do wonders for them. That's the upside. The downside is it's a lot more complicated for us. Um, I've, I've experienced this. This is something I've actually done. We used to do uh, in online learning pathways starting about 2014. We started doing a lot of our professional development sessions this way, where we'd have some people come into our instructional lab who wanted to, but we'd also kick off a Zoom meeting and we'd uh, allow people or make it possible for people to benefit from the sessions from their offices or from home. And it was wildly popular. We had far more attendance at those sessions offered in that way than we did uh, just offering them exclusively face-to-face -face or exclusively um, remote. And uh, it, you know, it's, it's a lot more complicated. Takes practice, takes some extra technology as we've been talking today, but it's not impossible to do by any means. It's just a little bit more challenging, but the benefits to the students are remarkable. It's basically not, like the conference call that the business has all the time, right? Uh, I'm sorry, now? I said it's similar to like when, remember back in the days of using a conference call? In right, the right, world? exactly. Exactly, it gives you, but it gives you so much more um, instructional power than just a, you know, a, a conference phone call. There are a lot of things you could not teach that way. There's not much of anything you can't teach by high flex. And I, I have yet to see it. I suppose it's out there, but I haven't seen it yet. So in, in the, summary, what you taught us is the yeah. cheapest way to do it, which is like less than two thousand yeah. dollars about sixteen hundred dollars yeah. if you have a meeting out which is super cool students loved it make it wired not wireless and it seems like wireless is where i think most people might have a problem and mm -hmm. some people try and use it on their phone certainly you can you can attend a high flex presentation on your phone yeah but it seems like it would be more complicated than if you just use a a couple of laptops and wire them to each other. Oh, you well, you you couldn't present from your present. phone. Present, but your students could be sitting at home using their phones to attend and be quite 
that it could be quite effective. Lisa, you have something. Um, yeah, I was looking at um, taking your list and go using it for a HERF request and just <laughs> outright like starting over. Um, but I'm now looking, wondering if I should just hang on to what they gave me. Oh yeah. And but the the like the 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 monitor they gave me is mm -hmm. a regular like seventeen inch monitor. Oh yeah. So it's not it's not right. It won't it won't yeah. <laughs> it's like no, not it's not gonna work. Is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's not portable at all. Right. Um I could leave it set up in the classroom. Yeah. But I don't trust it because I'm on the ground floor across the oh, street yeah. from the high school. So it's like oh, we've Lord. already had thefts. Yeah, I hear you. So you like um, yeah, it's city. I'm we're across the street from Garfield on one side and uh, San Diego High on another, and it's always a struggle. So um, yeah. I I don't want anything that has to be left in the classroom. Right, and that portable monitor is is so is light and easy to carry. Uh, Although the but the you said the iPad I have the seven the but the iPad it, would work fine. Yeah. Okay. It's not it's huge, but it's monitor. it is it is big, uh, big enough. It's I on think. the full size. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. And, and um, the quality of the display on the iPad is so high that even though it may be, things may be a little smaller, they're still going to be easy enough to see unless you're like me and you've had cataract surgery on both eyes and so on. And it, it's, I like bigger, but I've used an iPad for this and it, and it works fine for the secondary Thanks, thanks Dave. And, and nice that's real poor. <laughs> thank you this has been a lot of help i have to get uh, get going but thank you very you very too. much and nice to meet you lisa nice to meet you too thank you both so much for such an active participation today and let me know how i can help if you send me that equipment list uh, the thing list of the things they sent you lisa i can maybe add a couple of things that uh, that would help thank you my pleasure Bye to your wife. She really is a saint for letting me do all this. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Just a second. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. Just a second. I'll fix it so they can see you. Hold that's on. Oh. Oh, I'm just, I like to show it off. Oh. <laughs> there she is up there. Bye bye. 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 Bye, Flex. <laughs> All right, y'all have a good weekend. Sounded fun.